I keep my old heart in a plastic bag. My name's Jessica Manning, I'm 29 years old from Auckland, New Zealand, and I am currently studying a Bachelor of Education. I was diagnosed at three days old with six different heart defects called double inlet left ventricle hyperplastic right heart syndrome, ASD, VSD, transposition of the arteries and leaky valves. My mum noticed that things weren't right every time she would try and breastfeed me. Um, my lips would go purple and my breathing would go quite shallow. Um, they first initially thought it might be a heart murmur until they took me in for further tests when I was three days old. And that's when I was first diagnosed with one of my heart defects, but I wasn't fully diagnosed with all six heart defects until I was five months old. My life up until my transplant, if there was a roller coaster for a life, you know, I'm on the biggest roller coaster. So my life was pretty hard for my first six years. I had three open heart surgeries by the time I was six. But from then until I was 18, I honestly lived a pretty normal life. I had lots of friends. I had my fifth open heart surgery at 18, which didn't go well. My body didn't really cope with it. And that's when I needed a pacemaker inserted into my stomach as well. Around that time, due to complications with my lungs as well, I needed emergency lung surgery. So I was in hospital for a total of four months. I spent my 19th birthday in hospital and then managed to go home shortly after that. And within three weeks, I went into complete heart failure where my heart function dropped down to only 5%. I was in hospital for a further three months and recovered somewhat okay and then just had to manage the heart failure for the next few years until I caught the flu when I was 22 and that destroyed the rest of my heart and around that time I was diagnosed with stage one liver cirrhosis and that was due to the Fontan heart surgery that I had when I was three. The flu basically destroyed both my organs quite fast they deteriorated and then I was assessed for New Zealand and Australia's first heart and liver transplant. I was put on the transplant list in April 2017 and we have to keep our cell phones on us 24-7 and they have to be loud. So I waited 16 months. The average wait time in New Zealand is anywhere between three to six months for a single organ. Yeah, and I waited 16 months for both my heart and liver. I literally just had to wait by my phone day in and day out and just waited for that call and I received it at the start of September 2018 at about 6 o'clock in the morning. So my transplant alone took 20 hours and then I was in an induced coma for 5 days. Um, because of how incredibly weak I was going into my transplant, I actually lost all my muscle memory to the point that I couldn't even move my fingers on my own, I couldn't move my neck, I couldn't hold my head up. Um, they explained it as I was weaker than a newborn baby. I didn't even have the ability to move my ankles and my feet. So it took me an extremely long time to gain every inch of my muscle back in my body. And the day that I managed to stand up with a crane and assistance from all the nurses was the day that they found out I had a lot of fluid around my heart. And that was exactly four weeks post transplant to the day. But unfortunately that day they needed to drain all that fluid and I actually had a cardiac arrest where the defibrillator and CPR did not work so my surgeon reopened my chest and she manually massaged my heart for 25 minutes and because of that they had to put me back in a coma for another three days. Every bit of muscle that I had gained in the last four weeks I just completely lost again and I was back at square one. I was in ICU for a total of 53 days, ward for 14 days in cardiac rehab for 21 days. I think one of the hardest things for me though, it wasn't even the fact that I had the cardiac arrest or anything like that, it was more seeing my transplant friends actually have their transplants come into ICU and just like up and leave a few days later and here I am still in the hospital bed not being able to move. I had a trachea in so I can't even talk and I had multiple transplant friends have their transplants after me and they just came and went, came and went 
So mentally, that was extremely hard for me because I was like, I know I needed two organs done, but like, come on. <laughs> After I got my new heart, it was just such an incredible feeling because all my life I was only born with half a heart. So I was only just used to having half a heart. So the fact that I received this incredible gift, I've never known what it actually felt like to have a whole heart inside my chest before. The feeling of having a heart, like a full heart inside my chest, honestly felt, it was like the most incredible feeling because one, I've never felt it before. And it was just so incredibly strong and years leading up to my transplant my heart was just so incredibly weak like you know it was hardly beating so the fact that I had this full blown brand new heart like inside me I fell asleep for months just like listening to the heartbeat and it was just so strong that it was just louder than anything around me I could hear it in my head I could feel the heartbeat like in my head I could hear it like in my ears like it was like a super weird feeling So pre-transplant, I had extremely dark purple lips, dark purple fingernails, and I also had very yellow skin and very yellow eyes due to double organ failure. I also lost the function to just do everyday activities, so I could no longer shower by myself. My husband at the time or my mum had to try help me or I had to sit on a stool. I could no longer tie my shoes and do such simple activities. So having my transplant has obviously given me the ability to be able to do all these simple tasks and like a whole lot more with my life. Now I go to the gym four to five times a week, which is just not something that I ever imagined doing pre-transplant. So here in New Zealand, due to the culture and religious beliefs, the Māori culture, we can actually keep our organs or body parts so we can bury them with us when we pass away or also bury them in a sacred place. I actually donated both my organs, heart and liver, to medical research and science because of how rare my heart disease was. And they also asked for it to go to science. And so I said, sure. And then 10 months after my transplant, they no longer needed my heart. And they asked if I wanted it back. And I said, yes, for the reason being that I'm going to bury it. Once I purchase a house, I wanna bury it and plant a tree on top and dedicate that to my organ donor. But until then, I'm just using it um, for education and heart disease and donor awareness. So one of my most common questions is actually, what does the heart feel like? And for me to describe it, as you can see here, I'm like squishing it. I'm like squeezing it and it doesn't really budge. It's an extremely tough, rubbery texture, almost like a tire, like, you can press it and it's firm, but it, like you can dent it a little bit, but there's not a lot of, like it's not as squishy as you thought it would be. You know, when I first saw it and felt it, it it's extremely like dense and tough and rubbery, not soft. It is in a preservative fluid called formaldehyde. Um, and it is in that fluid and it can be in that fluid for up to 30 years which prevents it from rotting, smelling and decomposing. I'm honestly not sure what happens after the 30 years. All I do know is I'll definitely bury it before the 30 years is up because I don't know if I want to risk it. But they do say if the fluid looks like, you know, it's reducing or it's just like slowly disappearing then I can request to get more. I have never opened the bag for the reason being that I know the formaldehyde preservative fluid is extremely strong and I'm scared that if I open it, I won't be able to fully reseal it and I just don't want to risk too much oxygen getting in the bag and drying it out or drying out the fluid. I just don't want to risk it decomposing type of thing, so I just keep it in the bag. I did accidentally pierce a hole in the bag which is how I know how strong the formaldehyde is because it was an extremely strong, strong smell. 
So I actually ended up going to a butcher here in New Zealand and I asked them to reseal the bag. So that's the first time I ever took it out in public. That's the first time I ever showed it just to a bunch of random people. I'm not gonna lie, when I first ever saw it, I was like, what in the cookie dough is this? Like I honestly thought it looked like cookie dough. And so many people in my comment sections are like, that's cookie dough or that looks like a raw chicken breast. Like, this is the last thing that I thought a human heart looked like. Um, but it is like cut up and things because it was used for medical science. But yeah, it's just not the color that I thought it was going to be. Obviously, like most other people, I thought it was going to be at least like red. But then you just, you realize that a heart's not actually red if there's no blood pumping through it. You know, every time I actually look at it, it's so like... Weird. I do believe like the yellowy type color on the top here, how there's like two different shades. There's like a yellow color here and then like more of like a beigey brown color here. So I understand that the yellowy color is um, the protection fat layer of the heart, which most hearts have. And then the other like brownish color here is more just like the, the flesh of the heart. So a lot of people ask me, since I have a new heart, if my if anything's changed, like if my personality's changed or if I love my donor's family and things like that. Like my personality and my love for my family and that is all the same, but the only thing that has changed for me in the last three years is my taste in food. Um, I have this new love for vegetables that if you knew me, you'd never see a green thing on my plate ever. Um, so the fact that, you know, I love avocado now, I add spinach to everything, cabbage, pumpkin, um, I love coleslaw, like these are all things that I used to refuse to eat or pick out of my foods and things like that. So it's definitely a good thing. I don't know if that's just obviously my taste buds changing over the last few years or if it's actually a cell memory that has just come over from my donor. I believe that no other country actually allows you to keep your body parts such as your organs. You know, so it draws in a lot of attention and I'd say about 90, 95% of my comments are really nice and really lovely, just, you know, caring, supportive people. And then you always get the odd troll or the odd 5% that, you know, always just has something rude to say. But, um, you know, those, those things never really bother me. I get a few funny comments like you can literally wear your heart on your sleeve but i actually have a human heart tattoo actually on my arm here so i literally wear my heart on my sleeve i think the ones that really that i love most is just parents with heart babies saying how much i my story gives them hope for their child's future and things like that because i know it's not something my mum got when i was younger she always wished that she was able to talk to someone older who had heart disease because that would have given her a little bit more hope for my future and things like that. There was one comment that was like, um, why did your donor die for you? Like, what made you think you deserve that? And in my head, I just don't know if they solely just don't understand what organ donation is and how it works or if they were just out there, you know, just trying to hurt me or just you know write a rude comment and something like that it's very rare that i'd get a very mean comment like that i actually want people to understand the process of it all fully my donor actually passed away from a natural cause of a stroke um so she passed from brain injury and that's obviously something that us transplant recipients obviously have no control over we're on a transplant list and her family was just very fortunate enough um to say yes we want her to be a donor and then that's when they check her organs har harvest her organs and just look on the new zealand transplant list to see you know who matches her body size and her blood type and all that stuff and i was just very fortunate to receive both my organs heart and liver um from her i think after transplant the hardest part for me was just 
trying to live a normal life. I have never had, you know, a normal life. I've always been sick. I've always been in and out of hospital. So the fact that I've had this transplant and that I no longer need to go to hospital, it was actually extremely hard mentally and emotionally for me to just like start a life randomly. You know, I didn't really know where to start. That was extremely hard going from like a sick life to just now a very normal life. I, it took me a long time to adjust mentally and emotionally. So that was extremely um, hard for me. I always thought to myself, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Whether, this is what I say to everyone, whether you know it's to do with a breakup or a transplant or anything like that, and whether your tunnel is two years long or 25 years long like mine was, I strictly and firmly believe that there's a light at the end of every tunnel. And um, I think just the way that my mother has raised me, she always said a positive mindset draws a positive outcome and a negative mindset draws a negative outcome. So you kind of just have to try and manifest um, the positive out of it. You know, there's... Even if a situation is extremely hard, there's always going to be a positive within it. And I think you just need to manifest the positive and you'll end up um, getting through it.